Welcome to Firefighting Today, the weekly video roundtable discussion show where we discuss all things fire service related. Firefighting Today is a production of PeteLamb.com. And now your host, Chief Peter Lamb. Welcome to tonight's show, Firefighting Today, the weekly roundtable show. Uh, we are going to be talking about the variables of time. That's what we're talking about tonight, the variable of time on the fire ground or any emergency scene at all. Uh, we would ask if you are watching us live on YouTube, if you want to, uh, if you're on the YouTube channel, if you want to leave a uh, chat, a comment in the chat, uh, we would be happy to interact with you uh, and, and take your comments and your discussion. Also, if you are uh, uh, following us, uh, watching the show, but you're on Twitter, uh, we will be monitoring Twitter as well to be able to uh, take your comments and whatever it is you want to say, we'll take it right into the panel. We do have a uh, serious, significant situation that occurred today. And uh, as a firefighting show, we would be absolutely remiss if we did not recognize and acknowledge um, the, uh, the passing of Chief Alan Brunacini. Chief Brunacini had a medical emergency today, October 15, 2017. Uh, he did succumb to that medical emergency. There's not a lot of details that are out. Apparently, he was in the Phoenix airport. Uh, it's a, uh, a monumental loss to the American Fire Service. There are a lot of people that have done a lot of things in the American Fire Service. I'm not sure I know many people that had their fingerprints on as many things as Chief Bernasini did. Um, it, tens of thousands of people uh, have been impacted by this man as an instructor, as a man, as a human being, the blue card program. There's so much to be said about his legacy and much smarter people will be speaking about him over the course of the days and weeks and months as we move forward here. But I was not going to do tonight's show uh, without recognizing the loss of uh, Chief Alan Brunacini, former chief of the Phoenix Fire Department. So thank you for that uh, little indulgence there. So tonight, <clears throat> what we're doing here is um, we're going to see if we can discuss some of the variables. Uh, and, and we're specifically looking at the time variable. We're looking at what's going on, things that affect us. And, you know, historically, you know, you think about uh, a fire service has always been a time-based organization. And by that, I mean, why do we have poles? So we could get to the truck faster. 1940s fire trucks, no doors on the fire truck, just cutaways. You just jump on the running board, jump right in and speed. It's all about speed. It's all about that. And, and so tonight we're going to talk about, you know, Good speed and bad speed, if you will. Uh, there are times that we're we we should go a little slower, and and we do do that. So um, let's talk. Oh, first of all, I'm sorry. What a, what a what a guy I am. You guys aren't even paying attention to me here. Let me more, most importantly, let me uh, introduce my panel. I'm very sorry, guys. So uh, the panel, uh, Chief Link, say hello. Good evening, everybody. Rob Fling, an ex-chief with Dix Hills down on Long Island. And as always, a uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite, Chief. You're more than welcome. Uh, chief Woolery, say hello. Yeah, Lane Woolery, a battalion chief with uh, San Diego Fire Rescue. Thank you. Pleasure to have you. And you are on duty, so if you have to spring into action, do it. So, uh, Chief Cagno, say hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Chief Cagno, retired out of North Providence Fire, and uh, thanks for uh, inviting me, Chief. And last, but certainly never least, Chief Pernesti, say hello. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Chief Joe Pernesti. I'm with the City of Valeria, Ohio Fire Department. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome, Chief. Great, great to have you. All right. Sorry about that. I got all uh, all out of sync there for a minute, so I, I appreciate your 
patience with that. So we're talking about time. So in any fire situation, there are these points of time and these points of time. So the fire starts and then it free burns for some period of time. And I'm not talking about the free burning phase of fire. Don't, don't, don't confuse what I'm saying here, but somebody, you know, heat, fuel, oxygen all comes together. There's some permitted burn time. Somebody recognizes it. And then, you know, what do you, what do you hear from civilians when they know there's a fire? Hey, do you smell something? Hey, hey, it smells like something's burning or whatever, whatever. Detection points. Somebody figures it out. Maybe it's an automatic fire alarm. Maybe it's a sprinkler system. And there's some time it takes to report it. Now, in most of the country, I, you know, I don't have any data or info about our friends up north in Canada. But in the United States, it's about, you know, 30 to 45 seconds to handle a call from a dispatcher perspective. Um Somebody, so somebody notifies, they handle the alarm, that's about 35 seconds. I'd like to start interjecting here because then they push a tone or they strike a bell or, or whatever it is they do, and they alert the fire department. Now, what's the time variable here? As we look at alert time and turnout time, what is the... Uh, how does that vary in our worlds as panel members here? Uh, let's start. Let's start at the extreme. Lane, what does it take you from the time the tones drop or the radio notification? How long does it take you to to get out on the apron and and get moving? Well, we're looking to, to be honest. The, the guys get get out pretty quick for a structure fire. Um, I'm a little slower than the rest of the guys just because I don't have an aid or anything like that. So I'm mapping and navigating and setting up my radios all. Just by myself, but it's uh, yeah, it's I can't imagine an engine company taking more than ninety seconds to get out the door. The, the guys are really pretty quick once the tones drop. Right, right. Um, Chief Cagno, is that pretty common for you? Uh, yeah, I'd say about the same amount of time um, once the bell rings. Yep. Uh, Chief Pernesti, anything to add? No, I would say ninety seconds. Uh, I think uh, the fire service is all the same as far as uh, turnout time when the bell rings and it's a uh, maybe an EMS call to the same address you've been to a hundred times. Maybe the guys move a little slower. You got to sometimes as a chief kind of get stay on them. But I think we're all the same for uh, structure fire. Yeah, with one exception. And that's why I could, well, go ahead, uh, Lane, you want to jump in? And then I want to hear from Rob from a volunteer perspective, because I think that is different. Well, you know, Pete, the one thing I was going to say is um, on the front end, you know, the uh, we actually have spent a lot of money on some CAD upgrades that uh, we found that we had some bottlenecks in our paging and alerting system. And uh, fortunately, we were able to get some uh, a new generation paging system, which we were losing up to up to a minute getting the call out to the companies from the uh, dispatch center. Acceptable. So just um, in formulating the call in CAD, there was a bottleneck there where they had the address verified, but they had trouble getting the, uh, the units actually formatted into the computer for dispatch. It was almost like going back to the old, uh, you know, pulling the cards out of the game well system to see who was on the box kind of thing. So uh, fortunately, we were able to rectify that. Excellent. I do have a tear in my eye when you sit pulling the cards off for of the game well system. I do. I am a little nostalgic right now, so bear with me. <laughs> Chief Fling, how does this work? And, and, you know, you represent your own department, certainly, but how does this work in a volunteer system? And I'm at the line that says alert time, that is somebody's pager goes off on their belt, to turnout time, and I really mean kind of right up to the point where you're in the engine, you're getting it started, and you're you're, you're clearing the doors, kind of. Um, yeah, it's, you know, generally it's not as quick as, uh, obviously, as uh, the career departments that have the, the crews in-house. You know, um, it all depends. You know, we have, uh, we're fortunate, we have a bunch of guys that live close to the firehouse, and... From time of alarm to the time the first engine is on the road, um, it could be uh, five or six minutes. Um, it could be less than that. Um, you know, obviously, uh, we try to get out as fast as we can. Um, but it, there's, there's that big variable. Uh, where are the guys coming from? What time of day is it? 
You know, are you following the school bus down the road um, trying to get to the firehouse? Is it rush hour where um, traffic is just not moving? Um, the, there's so many variables. Um, yeah, I mean, you're I'm absolutely on that. I, I really don't know what else to say. No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, we had an interesting time of the year variable. I had a huge retail section, lodge shopping mall or whatever. And the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday, it, it, you know, you could you traffic, you couldn't move. You could not. It was a big deal just based upon the time of year. But I want to I want to do these last three. So we did alert time. So get out point and travel time. Um, nobody's probably having any issues in the United States or Canada because we're driving too fast to incident scenes, are we, right? Like, that's not something we've ever heard of. Even when we talk about the POVs and the, and the travel time to the station, and then we talk about arrival point, but just those two, the alert time and the get out point, we're driving too fast in Pete's opinion. My show, I get to give my opinion. You guys can give your opinion as well. But one of the things where we try to make up time, we're trying to save time, and we're driving faster to get to the station. We're driving faster to get to the calls. And if you look at our injury stuff and what have you, um, that's a big deal. Uh, we're going to get into some specifics here in a minute, certainly. Um, but the third one, the last one on that list that I want to talk about is this. And, and I think I've bemoaned this enough. I've ranted enough about this uh, in some of my podcasts and others. From the time you arrive to the time you set up, and, and let me just jump one more page there, um, from the time to the time you, you throw water on the fire to the time it's over. Uh, that's what we're talking about there, the arrival point, setup time, and attack point. I, I have to tell you, it seems to me that that is longer than I have ever recalled it being or imagined it being. It takes us an awful long time to get water on the fire in some of these things that I'm looking at. I understand we want to be slow and we want to be professional. But I guess the question and part of this thing, the reason I'm using these couple of slides here is this, and that is we need to set a context. You see, firefighters will try to make up time where they think they can, drive fast, do what I got to do. And then we, when we should be making up time, that is pulling lines effectively, those kinds of things, I think that sometimes we, uh, we jump the shark a little bit. We do have a comment. So... Um, uh, Captain Owens is with us from Henrico County. Uh, Middleton, Wisconsin uses, utilizes a rapid response model with attack pumpers and command vehicles equipped with ultra high pressure pumps to save time. Very outside the box thinking. Uh, he, he, Captain Owens calls the arrival point to the attack point zip time, zero impact period the time from arrival to when we're making a positive impact on the incident. So that's great stuff. Thank you for that, Cap. I appreciate that. So I kind of just put this up here for context. When are we trying to save time and when are we trying to make up time and how is that detrimental to us? Now, this is fill in the blanks. <laughs> this is the fill in blank portion of the, as, as offices, seasoned offices on the panel, what have you heard that, you know, I don't have time to do that. Uh, we're all supervisors. We're all shift offices or chief chiefs of department. In some cases, I, I don't have time to do that. Chief, you don't understand chief. I don't think I don't have time for that. Chief Cagno, what do you, what have you heard? Uh, well, I was I was gonna pipe in on you know when you you're talking about time to do things of in, in particular when you arrive getting off the rig uh, you know I could never uh, tolerate people that were going back for equipment like their hand lights or uh, you know whatever pieces of uh, additional equipment they would carry with them um, besides their tool assignment you, you know I I could never tolerate that that that, that stuff you should have with you when you step off the rig. Now, that's a lot right. of time no. wasted right there going back for something. Well, and that's a good point. So, so I, that's I how you. For that. I'm, I mean, when I get off the rig, I'm going. You better be behind me. You better have everything you need. 
Well, and that's true. And that's one of the ways we save time, right? You can gain time by being prepared, being trained, all of those things. That's one of the ways you can save time. What else have you heard on the fire ground? Things I don't have time for. We, we'll go into some specifics, but I'd like to hear what the panel's got to say. Chief Pernesti, you, you, you must have heard one or two excuses in your career. I don't have time for that. Uh, well, I think one is uh, 360s. Sometimes, uh, you, you know, uh, an officer will have a what they perceive as a, a life and death situation, and they don't do a 360. And uh, they, they try to justify it, but uh, you know, that, that to me is one that I've heard. Uh, another one is uh, communication between the, your, your crews. I think you gotta all be on the same page going out the door, uh, knowing who's gotta do what instead of trying to make it up on the fly. Yeah, it's a good point. It's funny, as the words were coming out of your mouth, uh, Chief uh, Captain Owen says, one of the biggest things I hear people say they have no time for is a 360. <laughs> so it's uh, there is a little time lag, but I think it was uh, just about at exactly the same time. Chief Fling, you've, you've talked to a lot of firefighters in your day. What what don't they have time for? Waist strap. The SCBA waist strap, because yeah. that takes... How come your you know, waist strap's not buckled? And for us, um, it's particularly particularly important because that's what our harness is attached to, uh, our self-escape. So, hey, how come you don't have your uh, waist strap? Oh, sorry, Chief, I didn't have time. Right, right. And and because, you know, that takes, you know, 10, 15 minutes to do that. You know what I mean? That's and a time I, time eater. You have, uh, you know, you probably, we have a, we have a big district, so... Some of some of your uh, in route times may be five, six, seven minutes, and not a problem. I always manage to get dressed. Right, right. Um, Lane, what are, what are you hearing? Things I don't have time for. Yeah, you know, it's um, it's always been the typical things. You know, the the culture has changed quite a bit about the things like gloves and waist straps. But for years, that was typically always the excuse. And you know, a lot of those little those little things are uh, really, it's, it's a laziness and lack of training that if you train to that standard, if you're good at it, it happens quickly and seamlessly, you know, mask up in just a matter of seconds instead of, you know, masking gloves and everything and they're ready to go in no time where if somebody doesn't do it very often, you can tell because it takes them a while. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we got, uh, we kind of pre-planned some of those, um, I guess the question is, and I'm going to get into what we what we don't have time for, but I don't think that we measure time very well, quite frankly. Again, it's Pete's opinion. Uh, we'll hear from the panel and, and what have you. I don't think that we, you know, that firefighter that says, I don't have time to do a 360. Um, have, have anybody actually timed a 360 in training? It's about a minute. It's a minute, minute and a half. Well, it's not if you're in a shopping mall, obviously. But in, in real life, if you're doing a, a, a house without major obstruction, you should be around that house in less than two minutes. Uh, things should be happening simultaneously while that's happening. While the office is doing a 360, uh, something should be there. Let's just run the panel real quickly. This is a wood frame house. It's maybe a Cape Cod style house or whatever. You park on the curb. There's not an extraordinarily long stretch. How long does it take to an advance and attack line? You got three people, uh, you know, an officer and two. How long does it take to get a line to floor two? Anybody? Yeah, Chief Pernesti, what does that take? I would hope less than two minutes. Less than minutes. two? I would say so. Okay. I mean, I'm talking the first arriving engine company. You know, a minute and 90 seconds is what I would expect. Uh, worst case scenario would be two minutes, but 90 seconds, I certainly would hope. Yeah. For, I, man, for, for two guys, you're talking a three man crew. My pump operator isn't doing much, but helping with the initial, you know, stretch to the front door and all that. But three people, 90 seconds. Yeah, I think you're being generous. Just, just me. I think you're being a little generous. I, I, I think if you said three minutes, you'd be okay. Uh, different shift, maybe five. But <laughs> yeah, I, I think there are some people variables too. 
But the point is, you know, it's interesting to me um, how many fire officers on your job, okay, you know the answer to that. How many fire officers on your job know the answer to that question? And, and therefore, you know, do they know how long that's going to take? You know, you take that and you look at the second one and you say, how long does it take you to get a line to floor five because you're operating on floor seven? You know, if you're two floors below the uh, fire floor, um, how long does that take? Um, Elaine, you've probably got the most experience to that. What is that? How does that relate? What, what would it be to stage on five and get a standpipe line headed for seven? You know, that uh, a, a working fire on the seventh floor, I'm expecting that to take, you know, a fair amount of time because, you know, the guys are going to have to go up and make the floor. And, uh, you know, we still have a couple of older buildings with some dry standpipes, which, you know, fortunately, because of the time they have to hike up, those, those uh, standpipes are going to get charged. But, you know, once they're going from five to two, that's a fairly, or from five to seven, that two floor stretch up from the staging area. That's usually pretty quick. It's just the getting up to the getting up to the five to start setting up. I mean, you know, you're talking ten or twelve minutes wouldn't be outrageous. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's you know, if you said to me, if you just kind of shot from the hip and said fifteen, it, that wouldn't have shocked me because that's a very realistic situation. And in some of our some of our smaller departments, quite frankly, fifteen would uh, would would certainly be there. Um, Chief Cagno, you want to dive in there? Dive in there. Yeah, to add to that, <clears throat> um, obviously you got the engine company that's making the stretch, but the other thing, you talk about time and conserving time, somebody better be getting up there quick, whether it's the truck company or a squad or, you know, whoever's not humping the hose, uh, somebody's got to be up there a little quicker, you know, to get an intel on things. But, uh, yeah, I would I would have to agree with Chief Lane. Um, you know, it, it takes a considerable amount of time, especially if your SOP say anything below seven floors that you're walking up, not using an elevator, maybe, um, if that's your policy. So it could take, uh, you know, a considerable amount of time just to get to the fire floor. But certainly there are other companies that, um, you know, arrive that, that can get up there a little quicker. Um and get some intel. Um, like I said, it could be the truck getting up there with a couple of cans, you know, taking care of doors or whatever. Um, but somebody should get up there a little quicker. How long does it take to make a hydrant? <laughs> uh, again, <laughs> that comes with uh, experience, practice, and training. Uh, well, know, is, it too, is it two no minutes time. or is it five minutes? It, it, to, to dress a hydrant? <laughs> It should be under a minute. Okay. Okay. Um, Chief Pernesti, what do you... Well, I was going to say, you know, I think of all these things, I look at these, and I think the biggest, the common denominator is you don't know unless you have trained your people and actually have uh, not timed them into... Well, yeah, if you wanted to time them in training... But if you haven't trained on these, I was la I'm not seriously laughing, but I'm just shaking my head. High rise operation on the seventh floor. I can think of maybe a handful of times in my career where we actually trained for high rise operations and I have high rises. And so it's an unknown. I have no idea. Right. And uh, I think a lot of ICs probably would feel the same. Maybe they don't want to admit it. I'll admit it. Uh, but I have no idea. And it, and it, you woke me up with a little bit with some of the stuff that I have no clue. Well, and I, I, I got to tell you this, Chief. I don't think you're alone. I don't think you're alone. I put the the, hy the hydrant one, you know, it's it, Chief Cagno says, oh, a minute or less or whatever. Uh, it, you know, the four-inch line, if you use a half valve, I don't know, depending on what you're doing. I mean, that can be a two, two or three-minute project if you're, if you're in a, into a big deal. But I say these things for a very specific reason, and that is, and we're going to get into it in a minute, and that is I don't have time to lay a line because it takes too much time. So if I follow Chief Cagno's theory, well, then it's less than a minute. So how much time are you saving? Um, you know, so we don't know what's real and what isn't. Here's the one that aggravates me. 
How long does it take a two-person crew to search a, a one-story ranch house? So we're, we're doing a primary search, two-person crew. How long does that take? Now, obviously, we'd send multiple crews in or whatever, but I'm just trying to get a benchmark here. How long does it take a two-person crew to search a one-story, you know, two-bedroom ranch house? Uh, pretty straightforward. Shouldn't take long at all. Especially, well, is it is it less than a bottle of air, or is oh, it more than a bottle of air? Especially with the technology that we have today. Um, but what's inside that one-story ranch house? Too are we crawling over piles of crap, or do we have a nice? Do we have an open floor plan that's sparsely furnished um, that we can whip right through this thing? Um, well, yeah, it's not a hoarding. This is kind of a, you know, it's a one room fire. It could be a bedroom fire. It could be whatever, you know, there's a, a hundred variables, but I'm just trying to get some sense of how long, you know, and, and you saw that my timeline, you see, as a chief officer, I learned a lot of lessons. And that was this, what can you do on an air bottle? What can you do on two air bottles, right? Because I, I don't, I got no stopwatch. I got no, yeah, I'm getting progress reports or what have you. But I think that that obviously that makes a difference. Captain Owens throws out in the chat room, obviously fire involvement. You know, if it, you know if they got to fight their way in there, uh, that that certainly makes some sense. So uh, Robbie's comment is, you know, fire involvement would would. Uh, affect the timeline in his opinion. And I think that's certainly, uh, certainly valid. Uh, vertically ventilated roof, you know, there's a couple of variables there. Am I doing it with a truck company or am I throwing a ground ladder and a, and a roof ladder? You know, what does that take in real life? Um, and, and again, I'm not looking for answers here. I'm, I'm looking about trying to generate thoughts for the viewers to get this in their head because they say things I, I, I think you could say when, when I put on the slide here, how much time does it take? I think all of us have heard somebody say, well, the, the hydrant one was, you know, I probably get three or four of those a week. Literally, I'm not making this up. I get three or four, you know, should I lay a line or should I not? Can I wait? I don't want to leave a guy at the hydrant. You know, it's, it's just like we get these variables and I, I hear it from all over. It's a big deal. Well, I don't know. I mean, if you're pretty good at, at dressing hydrants, then I say you lay the line. You know, it's just, it depends on, you, you know, the other thing that we talk about is, you know, what are your resources? What's your training level? What are your standards? You know, I mean, there's a hundred things that go to this, obviously. I'm just speaking in generalities, but these are all things that affect time. So, uh, Chief Pernesti. Yeah, but I think, I, I think one of the other things that we have to be realistic about is, you know, some of these things, um, well, like high rises or to vertically ventilate a roof, if your department has not done that a whole heck of a lot, um, as an IC, I think you have to give them a little bit of leeway um, if, you, if you haven't done it for real or you don't do it for real, it's not in your, you know, or you have two young firefighters who, you know, have never done it. Um, so I think it also is, it's, it's experience, uh, it has to be an asterisk there on a lot of these, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I don't think I disagree. Chief Cagno, you want to comment? Yeah, when you look at all of them items, um, you know, as a chief officer, you know, I'm sure you could relate to this. You could tell. Um, when a company was taking too much time doing any one of them items, uh, for example, like ventilating a roof on a, on a ranch house or a, a small cape or whatever. Um, I'm certain that, they, that any one of the members of the panel can, can say that they sat in the street and saying, like, what, what's taking the truck company so long to get this roof open? Um, I mean, you know when they're working efficiently or, or when they're not working. Then that's also a cue to you. Like if, for example... If they are slow, what is the reason? Um, I'd have trouble with a saw. Or, uh, um, is it an access problem? Maybe they can't get to the roof. They got uh, obstacles, uh, and they're using ground ladders, so it, you know it's taking them a little longer. Um, you know, I've I've seen 
Shof is that might not be familiar with the rig, um, having trouble just getting it. You know, the out rig is out um, because they're on a callback. Maybe they're not familiar with that that piece, um, and that can be very frustrating. So, and and it's in a career department. Um, but I think as an incident commander over the years, you could judge, um, you know, when things are moving in accordance to time based on your experience, you know, how long does it take to get that line in operation? Um, you know, like if you got like a, a garden apartment townhouse type of thing, we used to always, you know, walk around them buildings and say, you know, it's going to be a lengthy stretch or it's going to take time. we got a lot of bends. Uh, at night, it's going to be worse. We've got a lot of cars in the winter with, with the snow piled up, you know, it's going to take even longer. So you, 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 you could, judge your time accordingly. You could say, well, we're not going to get a line on the fire as quick in the middle of the winter at this townhouse uh, or garden apartment complex versus, you know, in the summer when, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's less of a problem with parking or whatever access. So you can judge whether your companies are working efficiently or not on any one of these items. Um, like uh, Chief Fling said, you know, it shouldn't take long at all to switch a one-story ranch uh, under, you know, um, normal conditions. Um, so if they're taking forever, what's going on? You know, is it something that you're not seeing? And if you're not seeing it, you should be asking. Like, you know, what's holding up the primary search, guys? Um, you got to be asking questions because... I think time is re relative to problems. You know, the longer it's taking something, something's not right. All right. That's good. Uh, yeah. Lane, did, I didn't know, Lane, if you had your hand up. Do you want to comment about the snow piles and not getting access? To, is that a problem for yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Big, big problem down here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, what, what John was talking about is, yeah, is I definitely, there's a, there's a certain amount of intuition that plays into this. And, uh, you know, as I'm sitting there at the back of the suburb and I've got certain, you know, tactical benchmarks I'm looking to check off. And, you know, I'm also looking to see the a bunch of white smoke coming out of the building, you know, at a certain time. And I'm waiting to hear that all clear on the primary. And, you know, I'm typically hearing the chainsaw running and then I hear it start revving and start cutting at a certain period of time. And if all these, you know, sensory inputs aren't happening, I start to go, hey, what the heck's going on here? And, you know, there's certain... In, if it's an uncomplicated situation, you expect certain things to happen in a certain, uh, at a certain tempo and time frame. Yeah, right. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, also from Ethan, you know, great, great point from Ethan. And that is, you know, something should be asked on any of these points or many of these points is when do you get your second company? You know, what's the order of response? How long does it take to get another company on scene? Certainly uh, makes sense. And particularly if that's uh, if that's mutual aid or what have you. So, you know, any of these and we got so you got set up a master stream. When's the last time you've done it, whether it's off the top of the truck, whether you're removing it and using a portable master stream, getting first water. It's one of my pet peeves. Um, and we'll talk about we had a good discussion, but we didn't get any answers or any solutions um, and so we're going to revisit some of what we talked about. But um, have you ever heard any of these? Well, well, we did actually talk about the waist straps on the SCBA. That came up early on. I don't have time to put the wheel chocks down. I'm too busy, Cap. I, you know, I got to, no time to chock the wheels on the, tr on the truck to stop the layer supply line. I didn't have time to check the equipment this morning. I don't have time to train. I don't have time to clean the rig. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just me, but I think I've heard I don't have time to do many of those things, certainly in my lifetime. And so, you know, I don't really want an answer. We're not going to go through those and say, how much time does it take? But I also want to begin to think, and, and, and I'll get to Chief Cagno in a second here, but I also want to get into the conversation that says, what are the consequences? Go all the way back to slide one. I'm driving too fast to the fire station. What are the consequences? I'm driving too fast when I leave the front ramp and I'm not stopping at intersections. I'm not putting the wheel chocks down. What are the consequences for any of those things? And, and I think that's really what we want to talk about. Chief Cagno? Um, 
I just wanted to comment about just these particular things in general. To me, that is just an excuse um, for any one of them items. The only reason why you can't perform any of them things would be if you were going up to help Lane uh, on a mutual aid run for one of that big forest fires, uh, you know. But other than that, you have all day to take care of all of these things. And some of these things can be done uh, simultaneously, like, uh, you know, stepping off the rig. If you haven't buckled your waist strap, do it as you walk into the front of the building, uh, whatever. But they're all poor excuses. We used to get them all the time. Um, I'm not going to deny that that I've never heard them, but they're poor excuses and, and, and consequences result from it. All right. Chief Pernesti. Well, I think uh, another question you can say out of, out of these is they may get, they may do these things, but they don't do them efficiently or, or um, effectively. So check the equipment in the morning. How much time does it take? Well, it, it could be a minute, two minutes, you know, or a half hour. You know, check the equipment in the morning. Well, I'd want to go sit at the table and read the paper and drink my coffee. So I think uh, to another flip side of this is, okay, if they are getting done or you see it, um, how efficient are they to do, to complete, or, you know, to complete them? Do you have a, um, as a commander or a boss, do you have a, you know, a certain timeline to get these things done Say, you know what, wait a minute, go back out there. Well, I got it done. Well, I, there's no way you check this complete truck in in five minutes. So maybe that is also a problem. Yeah. Uh, rather than not doing it at all. Let me go back to the chat room for a second. Captain Owen says, one, one question we have to ask is, when do we take time too seriously? You know, let's say we have a green patient in an MVA and we yank them out of the car versus taking time to cut the car out from around them. Recent fire, fire was out and we had cold smoke and no one would let the vent plan play out long enough to see if it would work. So is there, you know, I think what, what the captain's talking about, is there an artificial sense of urgency in some questions? It, it, do we force an artificial sense of urgency on some things as opposed to others? Now, I'm all over the... Um, I'm all over the board here. I'm talking about tactical things and I'm talking about cleaning the rig. So, I mean, we're looking widely. I'm just trying to set a perspective that time is important to us in a lot of different areas. Uh, comment from Nathan. Um, so let me just... Uh, when do, So Nathan says, uh, Chiefs, I'm enjoying the conversation and the thoughts. Here is my question. When is it time for a new officer to step back and let the crews work? And, and I, I assume that that question is related to time, uh, Nathan. So, you know, Lane, I think you probably had the closest answer to that when you were talking about there are certain expectations and it's, it's your experience that you need to do that. I, I will tell you this, here's, here's just a, a, a Pete's experience story. If you don't, if you let the crew do too much, there is a time, there is a place where you have to jump in. And I'll tell you this, has anybody on the panel ever heard the words, you know, if I had five more minutes, I could have got this. <laughs> I think we've all heard those words and had I not interjected or had any of us not interjected and let them have that five minutes, you wonder what would have happened in that case. So um, uh, Chief Pernesti, dive in there, please. Yeah, there's actually, uh, I'm not going to say any names, but there is a city nearby me where recently there was a house fire and a, uh, uh, an officer was up in the attic. They blew the horns to go. He's a, he's a, a, a chief officer and he w would not evacuate. And uh, the, the, the home chief's aide had to go up in there and uh, basically they got into a shouting match in a working fire 
And now that chief is, uh, he's under some scrutiny and some issues. And he kept saying, I just, give me a couple more minutes, get a couple more minutes, I can get this. So there's one where actually there could be some repercussions uh, following that. I've, first I've ever actually heard that someone could be getting seriously reprimanded for saying, just give me some more time. Well, I have to tell you, that's a fairly significant event for me. I mean, if uh, if a chief officer is in a command position, sees a hazard, that's probably a problem. I, that's that's not much of an argument for me. Certainly, I think uh, I think I'd win that war one to nothing, probably. But uh, but that's a that's a case. So, Nathan, to answer your question, I think that officers have to have some some patience. They have to let certain in part of what we're talking about here tonight. If if you have officers working and you're a young officer, you have to understand in your head that it's going to take five to six minutes to get that roof open. So part of what we put here and you can replay this episode later and watch it later. And that is, you know, figure those numbers out in your own time and then you know how long you should let you work uh, without question. So I think that that's uh, partially an answer in that case. So let's let's play this one out for a minute. When do we slow down? When do we slow down? I mean, I got a bunch of these. Do we should we be slower in these circumstances? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Is there anything that you want to uh, uh, say? Any of the panel members? How long does it take us to make a hazmat entry? From from you know fully blown technician level team to make a hazmat entry, Chief Ling, what do you do? Do you have county teams in? Uh, uh, we have certain departments that run hazmat as well. Uh, mine is not one of them. Um, I think I might have only been to three hazmats as long as I've been in a department, um, and one of them was a mutual aid. Um, I, I don't know. Um, for me, that would be a that would be an event. If I had command of that, that would be an event that would take me. I would have to slow down because it's not something that I'm used to doing, and I would have to I would have to think my way through that. Um, and this is exactly one of the cases um, I was going to bring up before. Don't be afraid to call for help. You know, if you get something that you're not um particularly well versed in and you think you're going to need it call somebody who is you you know this use your dispatcher has just you may know you know for for me i know the department that i'm going to call for a hazmat incident these guys do this all the time and they're trained to a hell of a lot higher level than i'll ever be so if i have something that i even think remotely is going to go down that road um call them start them out you can always turn them around if you ends up, you know, you don't need them. Thank you. I don't need you. But yeah, yeah, no, I, I would just say that my point here for for the hazmat was, you know, the time issue. Lane, how much to take? Uh, you're gonna send, uh, you're gonna send some techs in. You're gonna set up a decon. You got, you got an active leak. Uh, what does that take to make entry? Well, you know, Pete, I'm gonna let let uh, let you in on a little secret here. I'm actually, I, I'm a recovering hazmatter myself. So, uh, um, yeah, at one time it. Yeah, a level A entry, you're talking, you know, hour, if not hours, because, you know, the, the time, if it requires multiple entries to mitigate the problem, and that's where, you know, the, the, the real philosophy in, in hazmat is you, you hope the first responders don't do anything to make things worse. And then, you know, more often than not, there's no, you know, when there's no life at risk, then we slow everything way down and just be very methodical about it. It's, you know, and it's a lot of times where we do it to ourselves. We're all firefighters that are on the hazmat team. Well, if you take that firefighter mentality where I got to do it now kind of thing to the hazmat type call, you're going to have a bad time. Absolutely. And I think you're right. I mean, making entry on a, on a live hazmat situation, tech level A situation, you're talking 45 minutes to an hour to make entry uh, without, without much effort at all. 
to go back to Nathan, Nathan uh, just said, thanks for the info. He's a new officer in a combination department. And he, as a new officer, has found himself trying to rush things. And uh, you know what? I think I would just say I, I think the panel members can dive in as they need to. But I think that's pretty common. Yeah. You, you're, you're anxious. You're a little bit anxious. And uh, you 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 want to push things a little harder. So I would say to you, Nathan, don't. Yeah, that's okay. I learned from it, gained some experience, but that's not an uncommon thing. Chief Fling? Um, he's probably done most of the jobs that he's expecting to be done in a certain period of time. So take that experience and use it as a point of reference. Um, if you feel uh, you don't want to go too fast because the faster you go, the more opt you are to make mistakes. At the same time, you don't want to drag your feet. So, Use your experience as a point of reference. And as the officer of the truck, if you see things that aren't moving, um, not as quickly as you think they are, but maybe uh, uh, as efficiently or things aren't progressing to the level that you think, that's where you might have to be the cheerleader a little bit. All right, come on, guys. Um, let's get let's get the line to the front door. Let's throw our masks on. We'll go and get this. Or the exact opposite of that is true as well, because if you did your size up correctly and the guys are stretching the line, um, maybe they're stretching too much hose. Or maybe you feel that they pulled a pre-connect, a 200-foot pre-connect, and you're looking and there's no way this is a 200-foot stretch. So you're going to end up actually saving time by telling these guys that they're going to have to pull off the back of the rig. You see, am I, make, am I making sense here? Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll see if he answers this, but I thought that was a great response, Rob. I think that really uh, tells tells the picture. The other thing that we can correlate somewhat is that when we talk about slowing down for hazmat, how many people are we killing annually in hazmat incidents? Not many. Not many. There was a time in the early '80s we were we were tossing hazmat folks away pretty pretty easy on. But we've taken an approach that we slow down. We do what we got to do. Chief Cagno, jump in. Uh, I just want to kind of jump off of what Chief Flynn was saying. Um, there are times when, uh, you know, people have the fast and furious type of mentality, uh, but yet you don't want to go at a snail's pace. Uh, the other problem is, and if you look at some of the things you have listed here, like bomb threats, active shooters, anytime something becomes complicated, I think, people have a tendency to overthink things and they waste time. So, you know, as an officer, you got to know when to drive the wedge into an operation. For example, uh, if it's a technical rescue, you got to slow down a bit, uh, you know, do a lot more thinking in the beginning before you actually start an operation. But if the operation is getting snarled, um, you know, you, you got to drive a wedge in it. You got to you know, say, you know, what's, what's, what's going wrong here? Um, and, and maybe, uh, you know, correct them and steer them down a different path. But yeah, for us to, to go back to what, um, Ethan's question was, it, it can be frustrating. Uh, you got to let your people work, but yet there is a point where you have to drive the wedge into the operation and say, okay, um, you know, we're going about this in the wrong way. We, we, we got to change things up a bit. All right. It makes sense. And then all of those that are up there, the, you know, driving. So when do we slow down? Should we be slowing down on driving a little bit? Should we be progressive training? The military has the crawl, walk, run theory. You start at a very slow motion pace, then you do it normal speed, then you do it at an advanced or a high speed. Most of their training involves that model. Uh, other, uh, somebody said confined space, I think is a great choice for slowing down a high angle rescue, any of the tech rescue things I think would go for the uh, slowing down model uh, at some point. So, you know, we're getting, we're getting close. Let's summarize and see what we want these people to uh, take home with them. And that is this time. So first of all, hopefully the viewers got some sense from some experienced fire officers here that there are times we need to speed up and there are times we need to slow down. But I don't think you can do either of those in terms of if you don't even know what they are in the first place. You know, Chief Pernesti was saying, oh, should I time the folks on the drill? Yeah, absolutely. You should time them on the drill. Absolutely. I need to know. 
and I'm going to time them like three times because I want to see if it's an average. I want to see if it's a, a, a you know a quiet day or a, or a bad day. Let's let's check it and let's get some sense of that. I, I go out on occasion and I do uh, assessment centers, and the guy will look at a fire problem or a simulation on the board and say, "All right, the roof's open." The roof's open. Like hell, the roof's open. You haven't even got the ladder in position yet. Yeah, you know, they, there's no sense of time. So I think that if we're fire officers and firefighters, figure out where you can make up time. You driving your personal vehicle 60 miles an hour on a two-lane road to get to the station, that's not helping us. That's not helping us. Yeah, you're shortening up that time window to get the truck out. But in real life, that's not going to help us at the end of the day. We're going to get in trouble because of that decision, not stopping at, you know, intersections. So driving was one of the things where maybe we should slow down a little bit. So um, let's go around. Let's uh, let's do a summary round for members of the panel. And, um, you know, tell what is your final message here on we know there are times we need to hurry. We know there are times we need to slow down. We know we need to know what our times are. Um, so let's uh, let's begin to summarize. Uh, Chief Pernesti, what do you got to say about how time affects you and the operation? Well, as you know, I teach a class called Lost in the Fog, and time can get lost big time at an event. You can lose track of time, um, but you also need to know when to call a timeout as an IC. I, I think there, we do few, I see few ICs saying, okay, hold on, let's take a second. I need everybody to come out. Officers, we're going to talk about this. It, it, it almost like a team huddle. Um, but the bottom line is this. You have to know your crew's ability, crew's ability to handle certain situations. And the most common are stretching lines, getting water on the fire. Those two things, tonight I learned myself, we got to time those things. Those things need time. And as an IC, you also have to watch the time element, like the, what you showed was great, uh, but you also have to know when to call a timeout. I agree. How do we find you, Chief? If somebody's got questions for you, Chief Pernesti, how do we find you on social media? Where are you? I'm on uh, Twitter at uh, EFD Chief 3, and uh, anybody can reach out to me at my email, EFD Chief 3 at Outlook.com. And are you, you're a Facebook guy too, aren't you, Chief? I'm on Facebook. Uh, just type in my name, Joe Pernesti. And uh, I'm also on uh, Fire Training Toolbox and uh, Northeast Ohio Fire Officers uh, has a Facebook page that I contribute to. It's not my own page. Uh, I just contribute a lot to it. All right, good, Chief Cagno. What do we want the uh, What do we want the viewers to uh, to take away? Uh, how does time affect them in their operation? Um, I think tonight was a great a great uh, roundtable. Um, I I think we need to pay more attention to time as a, as a whole. Um, you know, operationally, um, what we do from, you know, from day to day, whether it be uh, the routine stuff from uh, checking our equipment in the morning, cleaning the rig, doing doing housekeeping duties, whatever. Um, you know, we, we need to probably start um, paying more attention to what time we're using wisely, what time we're wasting, um, and where we can make up uh, time on the fire ground. So... Uh, yeah, it was an eye opener tonight, I think. And where do we find you, Chief? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, or my uh, website, uh, lead it, J, uh, jcagnolleadit.com. All right, thanks. Lane, what do we know about time? What do we know about time from your perspective tonight? <clears throat> well, you know, the, the guys on the SWAT team have a saying where they talk about, uh, they say slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And you know what it comes down to is there's a lot about time we can't control. We can't control a delayed alarm. We can't control road conditions or, uh, you know, the fact that the first due is on a medical aid. So we have a longer response time, but we can control, you know, what we, what we prepare for in advance. And then what we do when we get it seen the, uh, the fastest, most efficient crews I see, I never see those guys run on the fire ground. And yet, they, uh, they move with the efficiency and smoothness of a NASCAR pit crew. 
So really, that's that's what you're looking for. Yeah, and where do we find you, Lane, on social media? Oh, best place to find me is on Twitter at Suncoast Chief. All right, thanks. Thank you. And uh, certainly, I make as many jokes as the next guy, Lane. But our thoughts, uh, our thoughts are with the firefighters in California that are getting. Uh, getting beat up there. You're in some uh, extremely hostile conditions. You're not having it right in the city, but uh, Northern California is uh, is probably one of the most catastrophic things I remember seeing in my career, certainly. Uh, so uh, thank you for the guys out West. No, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Chief Flink, what do you got about time? What do you got to say? Uh, I think one of the best ways to save time is just be proficient in all that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Well said. Where do we find you on social media? Uh, Twitter at, at face peace on and uh, email Robert D fling at gmail.com. Excellent. Excellent stuff. Um, I, you know, I think it's funny how we get all the way to the end of the session. There was tons of great stuff in this episode, certainly, but I really love the analogy about the pit crew where we can save time as a firefighter is becoming the highest level of proficiency we can. It's a training issue. It's a, it's a sense of urgency. It's experience. It's all of those things. And I think that that was a great way uh, to, to make a summary statement. So once again, we'll, uh, we'll be here next week. Uh, I do encourage anybody that the watches, you know, share the link. Uh, these episodes stay up there, so share the link. And if anybody is watching and would like this type of panel discussion in their own department, uh, whether it be on the topic of offices or tactical issues or what have you, uh, reach out to us and we'll be happy to uh, make this and show up virtually in, uh, in your meeting room if you'd like to do that.